Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Adrian Monk. Welcome to this session on tackling youth mistrust. We have a fantastic panel for you to talk about this this afternoon, and we're really looking forward to your questions. So please have your most concentrated attention on. Get those questions ready for us when we're done paneling. But before we start, we've got a very special guest to introduce us. Finding a break in his schedule, which I can assure you is the most packed in Davos. Very pleased and proud to introduce Professor Klaus Schwab. Sir. Thank you, Adrian. And if there's one session very precious for me, it is this one. Uh, because uh, I founded uh, the Global Shapers community just over 10 years ago. And now we have 500 hubs around the world in 500 different cities with over, with over 15,000 active Global Shapers. If I'm depressed, which I rarely are, but then I would go to one of the shapers happen to recharge my, my energy. I think uh, it's just amazing what uh, those young people are doing. Um, the request from each of the hubs uh, to show its commitment to the purpose of the World Economic Forum by running at least one significant local initiative with a social purpose. And the Global Shapers, in the last four years alone, have undertaken more than 2,000 of such initiatives to facilitate and improve the lives of the citizens in the hubs. Now, why do we integrate the Global Shapers? You know, uh, the World Economic Forum is a multi-stakeholder organization. Uh, we try to have each part of society very well uh, integrated in what we are doing. And um, the young generation is not sufficiently represented in international and global decision making. Uh, just think um, that the average age uh, in the world is somewhere around 29, if I'm not mistaken. The average age of those who take decisions about the future of this young generation is probably 55. Um, so there is a mismatch. And uh, so we decided at the World Economic Forum to create a special foundation which is associated with the Forum and which has its own autonomy, its own board, because um, we wanted to make sure that uh, the global shapers um, have their own identity in the world economic. So I just want to introduce uh, this fantastic community to you and what they are doing. And I'm uh, very glad uh, to have um, um, under uh, the leadership of um, uh, you, Adrian, um, now a discussion with four of the shapers um, which show you the outstanding uh, caliber of uh, this, those young people. And we could have also 15,000 here. And we have 50, by the way, here at the annual meeting, 50 from 50 different countries. And they will make sure that what we discuss here is also communicated to the whole Shapers community and so is an interaction. So I can tell you, you will go through some fascinating, uh, fascinating minutes um, of dialogue and discussions. Adrian, back to you. Professor Schwab, thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to ask our panelists to come up uh, onto the stage. We have four fantastic global shapers. And we have an amazing uh, colleague from the world of media, Kamal Ahmed who is, uh, has a stellar record in journalism in the UK and is also founding uh, a news organisation that I think he'll tell you more about, but is going to tackle some of what we're talking about. So first off, tackling youth mistrust. 
the Global Shapers community surveys its members uh, regularly, and this issue of trust comes up year after year after year. My generation, I was born in 1965, grew up in the shadow of nuclear war, the Cold War battle between the US and the USSR, and that shadow lifted in 1989, giving us hope that the coming decades would see progress, would see peace, would see people coming together to tackle the big problems. What have we seen in the last decades, in the first decades of the 21st century? We've seen income inequality. We've seen conflict. We've seen climate change. We've seen progress seemingly reverse on a whole realm of issues that I think any generation would expect those in power to have tackled or addressed or done something to move the needle on. And that really, I think, is underlying this issue of mistrust. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of these people. And I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about why they're members of this incredible Global Shapers community, and also why this topic of mistrust is so important to them. And I'm also going to ask Kamal, as a founder, who literally, I think his startup is weeks, if not months old, who's come into this environment wanting to use media and journalism to transform that relationship and transform that trust, to say a little bit about his mission and how the news movement is going to tackle some of that. But first, Miguel, I'm going to start with you and ask you just to say a few words. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you. This is, this is an incredible uh, honor just to be here with all of you. So a little bit about me. Uh, my background spans across uh, social entrepreneurship, advocacy, and uh, foreign affairs. Um, and uh, so the one reason why I really care about this issue is because when I was nine years old, uh, my family and I were forcibly displaced from our home in Colombia by, by, by violence. So I experienced uh, early on uh, the impacts of conflict and misinformation because that's what happened to my family, actually. We were falsely labeled as, uh, as members of, an, um, of, of a group. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, that's the reality for many other countries. Um, so, and then later on, I translated some of that passion into social impact, entrepreneurship, and, 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 and into co-creating uh, solutions to make this a better world. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Miguel, thanks. Taylor, just been a change of government in the country you've, you've left. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about you and about why this issue is something that gets you passionate. Of course. So I'm a global shaper from the Sydney Hub, and a week before the pandemic in 2020, took hold, I quit my job due to a long-held belief that if we are going to have truly collaborative and equitable global communities, we need the people who are least impacted by crisis to step up, take responsibility, and work in service of and in collaboration with those communities that are the most hit. And so 2020, I threw myself into that at an interesting time, which was uh, testing and educational to say the least, but it really showed me what's possible in this community and what we achieved with the Davos Lab and, and what we saw in the responses with the breakdown in trust and the fear felt by young people is really something that I'm entirely committed to serving with everything I have. Thanks, Taylor. Taha, you've joined us from down Lake Lehman in Geneva. Tell us about your journey and uh, what's got you passionate about this topic. Thank you so much, first of all, for having us here. Um, I... I grew up in Switzerland, but um, over the summers, we would visit refugee camps because of my father's work. And I remember very distinctly at the age of approximately 10, um, giving candy, as one would do, to other 10-year-olds just like me. And I was like, what's the difference between the two of us? I really haven't done much, um, per se. And uh, it was at that moment, it created a lot of guilt over time, but it also uh, instilled a certain belief that if I'm on this panel with you today, it's really not because I'm particularly smart or hardworking. It's because I had the right opportunities while I was growing up, particularly those outside of the classroom. So the confidence from my parents, the exposure. And uh, we really wanted to give those opportunities, which we feel are just critical to maximizing young people's potential, to millions of others. And so we co-created, uh, alongside my brother, um, an education technology company that helps young people maximize their potential by 
upskilling themselves and then connecting to opportunities, internships, scholarships, and jobs. And we work on that alongside governments, foundations, and corporates, which is just critical. Um, the previous panel spoke about the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement, so governments setting the infrastructure and the, 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 the setting for that. And so you know, failure to just provide youth with a basic expectation around a dignified livelihood, which hopefully is connected to their skills, creates deep mistrust. <clears throat> Olga, you've probably had one of the toughest journeys of anyone to, to get here from Keefe. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your background, what's happening with you right now, and also why this topic means so much? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm very appreciative to be here today, to have the opportunity to raise the voice for Ukraine in other circumstances. Uh, to be honest, there were many projects I was working in the past, there were many career passes and many personal aspirations. But to be honest, I feel that it seems that they are left in my previous life that I had before February 24, when the full-scale uh, Russian invasion has started. My country is in war now. The war that was actually started in 2014, that war that distracts all of us. This war is unfair and this war breaks all of the rules of the war, demonizing the Geneva Convention. So I'm here today as a seat, one of the millions of the seats of Ukrainians and also foreigners who support our resistance and to help us to fight it. And the reason of my mistrust and the mistrust of the Ukrainian youth that I am representing is an inability to meet this war and to meet the world crisis in the proper and especially a fast way. Thanks. Kamal, you have started a new news organization, the News Movement, and that, my sense is, is aimed at addressing some of the issues that we are talking about here today, which is this issue of trust, this gap in belief. And we've seen, haven't we, in the last probably five years, you know, an expectation that rising levels of education would make for a more critical, a more informed, a more demanding audience, a more demanding citizenry. And instead, we seem to have gone back into a phase of propaganda, of misinformation, of disinformation, of, of viral messages that bear no relation to reality. What do you think something like the news movement can do in this environment? And what do you think media more broadly can do to help bridge this gap? Well, look, first, thank you so much, Adrian and Professor Schwab, for inviting us along. We're a very young company, um, as you say, just been in beta at the moment for the last uh, three months. I'm moved tremendously by the stories of you four. And I think Professor Schwab nailed it when he said the decision-making um, for people uh, who make decisions, average age is 55, and the people affected, their average age is 29. And I think all of us in the media, I've been fortunate enough to have a long career at the BBC, The Telegraph, The Observer, The Guardian, and elsewhere in my career, what are called traditional media uh, companies. Uh, for all of us, uh, we are aware that there has been this big shift in trust. But at the same time, we can see from conflicts in Afghanistan, Syria, the war in Ukraine, the COVID crisis, climate, the need for trusted, fact-based journalism is greater now than it has been for a long period. But there is a gap, as you say, Adrian, and we know that uh, because of that gap, because of the way the media operates and maybe who makes too many of the decisions, that younger people particularly uh, have an issue around trusting the media. And we saw from the Edelman Trust Barometer yesterday that the media, governments, business, all have this issue around trust. So the news movement with others wants to create communities, partnerships, platforms where we can work together, led by young people. I am super old. <laughs> our team, our young newsroom, at the moment based in London and New York, we're a New York-based uh, company with a, with a UK base as well. Average age, 24. They make the decisions with the guidance of myself and our co-founders that include Will Lewis, the former president and chief executive of Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones. But young people should drive the conversations that the media is having. And no storytelling works 
without story listening first. So we need to listen to our audience, our initial demographic that we want to serve. And I think your point about humbly serving communities is 18 to 25. And it's by listening to those audiences in the best way we are able that we can hopefully start challenging this mistrust that has built up because of the perception and the reality to an extent of the gap between who runs the media and the younger audiences that don't play in the spaces, Adrian, that you and I grew up with, television, newspapers, even websites now, but play in spaces, digital social media spaces from TikTok to Instagram to YouTube to Discord, wherever it might be, to Twitch to Reddit. And we need to understand as the media industry, as many in the media industry do, that we need to change the way we do journalism to engage younger audiences in the importance for their navigation of the world of trusted, fact-based, useful information. Thanks, Kamal. I think when you reflect on this generational mistrust, one of the things that I'd love to hear from the panel is not just how do we tackle it, but also we tend to think of mistrust as just having a negative impact. And I mean, from my perspective, I see that impact, but I also see in communities like the Shapers, that tr mistrust turning to a realization that youth activism and youth engagement is gonna have to be so much more pronounced. And I wonder if the panel feel that that mistrust has spurred them towards getting involved, not relying on others, not perhaps doing what my generation did and think someone else was gonna sort it out. You know, someone smarter, someone in office, someone in a ivory tower somewhere. I wonder if that's something that has motivated all of you in some of what you do. And maybe, Taylor, I mean, can I start with you? Sorry to put you on the spot. But, you know, what's your sense? Is that, that are there mechanics that we can use to bridge that trust gap? But also, has that lack of trust certainly taken you on a journey or people that you know? Mm. As far as the journey with distrust, I would say my experience has been moving from frustration and distrust to discernment and an idea of exactly what I expect and the standards I expect myself and the leaders that I work with and look to to hold. And so I think you're definitely hitting on a point that's incredibly valid, which is that there is a purpose to be served by the discontent that we feel. But we as young leaders or as leaders and citizens in total have a responsibility to channel that into something deeply productive, deeply collaborative and that's solution oriented. So I'd encourage that to move towards empowerment and discernment and sort of critical analysis of what we're looking at. And Taha, you, you know, you talked about your, some of your formative experiences. You know, are there things that you see as potentially helping us to bridge the gap uh, between the, you know, the generations in terms of restoring some of that trust? Or is it something that's irredeemably broken and you, know, you think that your generation is now gonna have to fend for itself? So youth don't necessarily start distrustful. <laughs> um, it's, they have certain expectations which are somewhat reasonable. Uh, they would like trust of their, of, their, of their leaders. They would like shelter, they want peace. But one point I would like to emphasize is the, the belief that they deserve to pursue a dignified livelihood, ideally matching their skill set. And uh, for governments and for leaders, if they want to be able to earn that trust, one has to go back to the basics, which is that livelihood that they're pursuing. And it's incredibly complicated, but as was said on the panel before by Bob, from PwC and Jeff from Coursera, governments are critical to putting together the framework and the infrastructure to be able to tackle this very complex problem. It's incredibly difficult, but if one wants trust, it's critical. And that, you touched there on the cost of living a little bit and the livelihood promise. You know, the promise growing up in the 60s and 70s was that if you got educated, you would get a job. If you got a job, you'd be able to buy a home. If you bought a home, you'd be able to bring up a family. All of these promises seem now to be on checks that aren't being cashed. How do we fix that? How do governments fix that? And is that partly at the root of this crisis, Miguel? 
You know, I actually agree with everything that's been said so far, and I can actually relate on a personal level. Uh, what you were saying about mistrust, I think it's, it's good to have a healthy uh, level of uh, skepticism, to have critical thinking, not to just take things for granted, uh, to take all the information and just believe in it. Um, so that, abil that ability to have critical thinking from an early age is important. And that's why I think we need to start thinking about, well, about rethinking education from an early age. How do we integrate civic engagement so that uh, folks from an early age know how they can best channel their ideas and frustration in a way that is effective? And that's where you see the added value of intergenerational allyship from an early age, mentors, uh, having support systems uh, from an early age. And I can relate on a personal level. You know, I, I, I graduated in 2015, went to university, did four co-op terms. Uh, I you know, spoke various languages and I couldn't find a job. So uh, I could definitely start feeling the frustration and, and, it's that, and it's out of that frustration that came the desire to then launch what would eventually become a nonprofit by accident um, because I didn't find, uh, because I didn't uh, find the proper avenues uh, to advance the issue of, of uh, climate action. So yes, definitely leaders. Uh, so it, it, first we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, why was there that breach of trust in the first place? Second is also that there are also differences between the global north and the global south. In some countries, it's dangerous to even raise your voice. So we need to ensure that those fundamental freedoms are, in, are, are assured uh, in the first place for those, uh, for those places. So rethinking education, rethinking uh, civil society engagement. Perhaps uh, uh, the last thing that I would say is that we need to move away from those extractive consultation frameworks and instead embrace the value of co-creation and co-design because when you're doing that, you're giving young people an ability to shape policies. And I'm thinking of the youth recovery report that we, uh, th we co-led with the Global Shapers community, which um, um, engaged the voices of two million people around the world in over 150 cities. And it was a true example of intergenerational allyship between young people and leaders. And I think that's an example worth exploring. So definitely check it out because it's a great report. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah. I mean, no one would ever wish to see what's happened in Ukraine visited on any country, only people. But it's also true that it's produced some incredible moments of leadership and of generational collaboration and of young people stepping up to take real leadership roles in what is an existential crisis for Ukraine. Olga, are there some lessons from the very dark experience that you and your country have been through that maybe speak to this? Uh, yes, when the revolution of dignity was happening uh, in Ukraine um, in 2014, I thought I've seen everything the best Ukrainian society could do with respect to cooperation, with respect to raising their voice and speak up for the future that we want to have. But something that I'm facing at the moment in Ukraine, it's terrifying what are the circumstances we need to be there and we need to act that fast. But also it's inspiring how strong we are. So I would define myself as a seat, uh, as I told before, because there are millions of Ukrainians who do everything possible and impossible. And from what I've seen in Ukraine, I'm confident to say that Ukrainian youth initiatives, they would be easy to compete with the state authorities' initiatives, with the governmental and non-governmental organizations, and with the large global businesses. Something that I'm observing at the moment in Ukraine that Ukrainian youth was never united so strongly since the Second World War. There are incredible things we are doing, as for example, uh, fundraising one million from the Ukrainian IT community to buy the fighter drone just within 24 hours without any outside parties involved, to build the startup that would create a subscription to help our militaries by Ukrainian product IT community then our farmers who would fight and who would take back from the Russian military their tanks just with tractors. And then these tractors would be used to seed the new harvest under the missiles just to make sure the world is not suffering from the hunger. And finally, what I'm seeing are the Ukrainian warriors at the front line who are demonstrating the impressive and unbelievable courage in front of the danger in Donetsk, in Luhansk, in Mariupol, and all around the Ukraine. Oh, Olga, thank you. <laughs> Kamal, just turning to you, I mean, I think we're both of a generation 
um, where perhaps learning to ally with younger generations is a challenge for us. And you talked a little bit about that in the news movement, but how, how are you trying to play that role? How are you trying to enable, empower, um, co-create with this generation? Are there, you know, are there lessons that you've learned? Well, I'm learning sitting on this panel, frankly. I mean, Miguel, you know, you said absolutely right. It's this notion of partnership, which hasn't, Adrian, you have a long and distinguished career, not only at the World Economic Forum, but before that in the media, particularly in the UK. And Adrian, we would know our generation, partnering and co-collaboration between media organisations was unheard of. But the news movement, we are partnered with the Associated Press uh, globally and with ITN in London. Uh, we want to work with um, other media companies at together solving um, the challenges that the, the media uh, faces. We're called the news movement for a reason. There is purpose to what we are doing. And I think when you ask me individually, what have I done? So we are trying to create, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the news movement, but create a different way of leading this organisation to listen to our young teams and to also listen using the most sophisticated tools we can um, around social listening to think about what the conversations are that young people are having. Um, my son is 18, my daughter is uh, 22, and uh, as young people uh, can do so well, he, he asked me an unanswerable, or a question I really struggled to answer. Uh, I used to be on the BBC, I used to be the economics editor of the BBC, regularly on television, and uh, my son would dutifully sit down and watch his father on the telly, because that was his father and that's you know, what he did. And he said at the end of one of the news bulletins, um, very clearly and distinctly to me some years ago, so he was a bit younger. Dad, why is that the news? <laughs> I.e., why is that set of things that you're all talking about the news? And I found it very hard to answer. Well, because groups of, let's be frank, mostly men in different rooms around the world have decided that is the news. Well, it doesn't mean that's what you think is the news. And so we, as a media industry doing our job brilliantly, as we so often do, and putting lives at risk, as we have seen in recent years and months, um, we also need to understand that we need to break down the notion of what is news and listen to young people about what matters and understand that there are many more notions of what the global community is, where people are as interested in Davos as they are in Dhaka. They want to know what is going on, not just down the road but on the other side of the world. And we need to understand that. And I think that means making different decisions about the stories we pick. And one key thing about rebuilding trust for media organisations is transparency. Why have we come to these decisions? So we regularly at the news movement show our journalists doing their work. Who have they contacted? Our morning meeting when we discuss the news. Well, why are we talking about these things? One of the most interesting things about Ukraine and covering Ukraine, if you looked at what people were searching for, this is in, in Western, I, I speak, and I apologise for this, I speak mostly through a lens of the Western sort of developed um, economies, which is where I have worked. But, so forgive me for that. But when it came to Ukraine, um, the thing that was most searched for by many, many people before Putin invaded was, where is Ukraine? And the media often starts... Series 6, Episode 5, when lots of audiences haven't seen the first five series and don't know where you are, and you've created this huge gap of what I sometimes call posh news for posh people. So we started our first explainer on Ukraine, which got over 1.1 million views on TikTok, with literally, it's here on a map. This is Ukraine between this big country here, Russia, and the rest of continental Europe here. And we pointed at it. And we showed ourselves finding this out because that's what people were searching for. New mechanisms, Adrian, we can use and hopefully engage young people in, in the journey of, of helping them navigate the worlds around them. Thanks, Kamal. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for just setting the stage for us. I'd really love to bring our audience into the conversation. And while perhaps we look around and see if I can pick out any <coughs> hands amongst you, um, I just want to throw out the idea, too, that perhaps for the generation that currently has power, you know, 
it's more important even for them to learn how to share authority and share decision making. Because I recall growing up in an atmosphere of apprenticeship, of earning the right to have a voice. And actually, we all have that right. It's not earned. You don't pass an exam to vote. You know, you're not considered uh, unworthy of human rights. You know, you're granted them by virtue of your humanity. And I think some of what you've been saying from here is a lesson to Kamal and I, and I'm sure other people of our age and generation in the audience, which is we need to rethink how we adapt. You know, you don't necessarily need to rethink it. It's us. So I'd love to hear from people at every stage of the generational game. <coughs> and I can see a hand there in the middle. And I'm going to ask you to say who you are, if you wouldn't mind, and give us your question. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Fatima Zahra, and I am a global shaper from Rabat Hub in Morocco. Um, so I heard this really interesting quote in one of the sessions in the morning that said, power does not concede without a demand. And so my question to you is, um, how can we make that demand as effective as possible from your own perspectives? It's a great question. Um, Miguel, can I throw that one first at you? I'm actually trying to understand the question itself, so... <laughs> well, the power doesn't come without demand, and how do we make that demand? How does that demand get made? How does it get articulated? You know, How, how do you get that voice, I think, into the conversation without simply asking that nice people in their 50s mm. give you that opportunity? Mm. That's a great question, actually. Well, I think the fact that uh, the vast... I mean, a, a huge amount of the world's population are young people. And the decisions that are being made nowadays are going to impact uh, uh, folks in, uh, in, into the following decades and generations to come. So there is that argument that we need that intergenerational parity starting now. Uh, it's not just because it's a nice to have or because young people bring an added value to evolving trends, uh, you know, like what you're saying about adapting, so important. Uh, but it's because it, it, is just how we're thinking about having that diversity and inclusion lens, having equity-seeking groups, having more, uh, more voice at the table, it's important for us to bring different generations because the decisions being made nowadays are going to impact us into, uh, in, in, into, into the following decades. I think that's one of the best ways to ask for it. Olga, maybe I can just turn to you on that. Yes, uh, I would say that we don't need to ask for that. Uh, but from the experience I see now uh, in Ukraine, we need to compete to see that our ideas are valuable, to show that our approaches are working, and to get to that point when we are so strong and we can create so much value that the other generations, the generation in power, would come to us and include us just because of the innovation that could help them to move forward and move faster on their agenda, just so that the sources that we have, the investments that our approachability and our great ideas could involve, that's something they would like to share. So at this point, I will see that the best way to create the demand is to be strong. And this is something that Global Shares community is doing now. And the important is not to ask, but to be asked, to be seated at the table. That's when it's not going to be formally but it's going to be in real. Thank you. I'm going to try and see if we've got some more questions that we can get around to in our audience. And um, if I can see the hand just there, and we can get you a microphone. It'd be great. So thank you, Andrea, for um, moderating such a touching and wonderful um, session. And thank you, my fellow shapers, for sharing your personal stories and insights. I'm Roxy Liu. I'm a proud, ship, a proud global shipper from China. And so my experience is that um, I, I was born right after the World War, uh, sorry, Cold War. And uh, what I experienced was all, I pretty much benefited from all the uh, globalization and uh, everything was going upward in a positive way. And if, if you ask me, if you talk me to me uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't imagine a world would be like this. And um, however, um, my favorite book, um, The World of Yesterday by Stephen Zweig, told me that history re repeats itself. So I'm sure that mistrust among the young generation or among all generations is not the first time um, happening here in the world. So my question would be, um, how can we as the young generation to drive the change, to make the world um, a better place, or like to 
to eliminate this mistrust today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to throw that one at Taha and Taylor. Um, thank you. I think it's a great question. Just picking up on what Olga said, um, at least my experience, and I, I, think it, it's, it's, I think it is a truth, creating momentum is the greatest way to get something done. So, uh, Adrian, you asked, uh, did, I, did I lose trust uh, in the systems with my upbringing? I did. I, I have never worked for an institution. I think by the most I did was some coffee and some photocopying. And then we went out and built our own thing to try and solve the problem in the way we thought we could. And it was by gaining that momentum that we brought on literally governments and leading organizations with us um, to, to then, which we, which we absolutely need if we are to hit the scale that we need to hit. So I think it really comes down to taking that initiative, whatever, and I think this is replicable across many problems, take the initiative, run with it. Ideally, it's innovative, it's different. And then I think people tend to follow. It's a bit like creating a movement. I'm not sure, I was just speaking about this earlier, about that TED, that TED video. You need, you need, those, you need those, those, that, that momentum at the beginning and then people, people tend to follow. Thank you, Taylor. I would say two things. Number one is that we need to change the system rather than seeking to tread water in the same ocean that we're currently drowning in. So, you know, for me, that's working in future generations governance and how can we have those elements of infrastructure that actually question, does this serve people in the future? And then the second thing would be is that we need to seek not to pendulum swing because we can so easily create the opposite problem that we have now a few years down the line. So similar to the feminist argument, we're not seeking to be the most important party. We're just seeking to be equal. I want to hear from my elders. I want to hear from existing leaders and work collaboratively. And so I think we should seek to chase balance, not to drastically swing in the other direction. Thank you. I just want to bring Kamal as well as say, I mean, Kamal, you know, you're, you've worked a lifetime in, as you said, in mainstream conventional prestige organizations, but you've kind of started again with the news movement. Do we need to start again more with some of the kind of foundational institutions of delivering yeah. uh, what we deliver? I think, Adrian, that's a powerful question. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the news industry is now understanding the need for fundamental change in the way um, they create and then distribute um, news and information. I think to Fatima's point, it's not about what demand is made. The fact is that you are, Taylor, as you say, creating new areas for new discussion. The whole distribution of media is no longer controlled by the media. So the revolution in digital and social and influencer and now creator economies has meant that if the traditional news industry doesn't partake in this new, um, uh, this new energy that is behind the idea of a new generation is coming, who will fundamentally change the way we need to think. If the media doesn't do that, then it is at existential risk because the pipes are no longer in the control. You know, if you published a newspaper and had a news channel, you were in control of the message. Well, that is no longer true. So the demand is actually made by the shift of the audience. And if you look at young people in particular, and when I say young people, I'm then talking below the age of 30, they have shifted. So there is a responsibility on the news media. If we believe journalism is vital to good society, which we do, to move as well. Thanks, Kamal. And uh, Roxy, thank you. I mean, China's rise and the incredible generational transformation we've seen there is one of the stories of the last 25 years. Um, just want to see if we can squeeze one more question in before time takes away from us. And perhaps I can call on the gentleman in the front row. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, impressive session. Uh, do you think the uh, education system contributed to the mistrust? So when you're 18, you're still a high sc school graduate. When you're 22, you're still a graduate of a bachelor's degree, and you need a, your master's after two years, and then you, you need yeah, PhD for four years and then you're 29 and you don't have years of experience and so on. Mm -hmm. So do you think this is part of the mistrust that was created, the education system and number of years um, contributed to that and how we can solve that? Mm -hmm. 
great question. Um, you know, I recall growing up with people who'd left school at 14. My dad left school at 14. I was lucky to be able to leave school at 18 and then go to university. And I think, to your point, you know, education has become, if you like, a credential or a kind of system of hoops that young people have to jump through now in order to qualify for the jobs market. Is that something that we should be grateful for in terms of that of more education in people's lives or have we created a set of false kind of fences for young people to to jump uh, yes I, I think that's that's definitely part of the reason so it, it's it's that failed promise that was made that you go to school you get good grades uh, you go through university and then you'll get a job and I can tell you that's not the case for a lot of people uh, in my generation so uh, we need to rethink about uh, how education is from an early age, incorporating more emotional intelligence, uh, civic engagement, providing people with the tools so that they can survive in the, uh, in, uh, in the new economy. Uh, we are seeing the rise of the gig economy as well, so legislation also needs to uh, modernize so that we can protect those workers so that, they can, so that they can compete. And at the same time, once you modernize that legislation, and some countries are doing it, uh, then you also provide a space for innovation, for new ideas to thrive, for people to take action, as you were saying. So there is incredible potential out there for young people, uh, but, the, but the systems really need to change. So building on Taylor's point, we need to rethink systems. And, and I think the pandemic has provided us with, 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 with an opportunity to, to, to pause, uh, to reflect, and rethink how things could be done. And Taylor, can I just bring you on that? Absolutely. So I absolutely think education is a privilege, and I think especially someone who's had the fortune to experience a lot of education, I certainly would never undermine the value of that and how lucky I've been. However, I recently completed an MBA for the pure reason of hopefully older people listening to me and completed it alongside trying to run my business. And I think that, that therein lies the exact challenge is that I don't believe that I'm actually using a lot of what I learn in the work that I do but it has made a material difference to how much people listen to me. And so it's a matter of rethinking what does credibility mean to us? How do we measure credibility? And exactly to your point, how are we constructing our education system to empower agency and critical thinking and creativity? Thanks for that. As a former university professor, I can say probably the worst served people in the world is anyone over the age of 21, because universities have not adapted, in my experience at least, to bringing people my age, Kamal's age, some of your ages back into the university system to relearn, re-up their skills, get back into things. And that, to me, remains a massive challenge for the generations ahead. I want to have a very quick final word from our remaining three panelists before we have to sadly close the session. Uh, Kamal, very quick word from you on, if there's one thing that you could do to bridge that gap, what would it be? Well, launching the news movement, I hope, is one tiny <laughs> stick in the new bridges we need to build. But we need to regain that trust. Otherwise, journalism will suffer. And if journalism suffers, good society suffers. So the media industry needs to find new models. We need to do it in partnership with young people and in partnership with each other. And you're absolutely right, Adrian. Every day, whatever age you are, is a school day. Learn, listen, and iterate. Ta, can I throw the same thing at you? help young people access dignified livelihoods. Really bringing together the different stakeholders. We desperately need the most committed minds, the, the talent to solve this very complex problem. There's great minds going towards climate action, which is critical, but, but not enough focused on the problem of connecting to dignified livelihoods. Um, partnerships, capital, um, yeah, re really, really accentuating, really coming together around that. Thank you. And Olga, final word to you. You've shown us some incredible inspiration and some hope um, in the toughest of circumstances. Uh, well, I'm here in Davos. Uh, my heart is obviously in Ukraine uh, with my people who are in war. So at this point, I would say that uh, we need to be brave. As Ukraine, it is in the moment. And to be brave, to stand for our values, for the values of democracy, for the values of freedom, and at some point when we are making decision and when the generation in power is making decision, it may seem that the cost is high to stand up to their values. But uh, it's important to remember that while freedom is priceless, the freedom has its price. So uh, I would encourage them to remember about that 
and to act their best possible way to protect our values because basically this is what unites all of the generations who are now in our world. Thank you. Olga, thank you. And please thank all our panelists for their contribution. Thank you for joining us. It feels like we've barely touched the surface. I, there's a lot more to explore if you look up Davos Lab on Google and uh, go and see that survey. Thank you all. Have a productive rest of your afternoon. And thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>